Bitcoin has uh, what I would consider mathematically more sound or even more predictable and programmatic supply curve because it's built on mining and the halvings and whatnot. So uh, I do think Bitcoin is a superior form of sound money than gold. It's Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, and this is Markets Daily, a show where we get into the minds of the smartest and most experienced investors, traders, and analysts. I'm Jen Sanasi. Before we get into our discussion, let's take a look at the prices today. According to Coindesk Indices at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, Bitcoin was down more than 7% at $63,023, Ether down 9% at $3,272, and the Coindesk 20 Index was down more than 10% at $2,382. For more on the market's action, let's bring in Head of Strategy at Kraken, Tomas Perfumo. A month ago, we were hitting all-time highs, and this morning, everything's in the red. What do you make of what's going on in the markets this morning? Yeah, I think when you look historically at Bitcoin prices, you tend to see uh, these big pickups and then, of course, consolidation. So uh, in the big picture, you know, we're still up 40% year to date. So, of course, fantastic performance. I think a lot of the more recent price action has been driven by uh, the fund flows that everyone's watching into the ETFs. And so we've seen a little bit of a deceleration in the last couple of days. But nevertheless, you know, Bitcoin ETF uh, across the board in the U.S., has set all kinds of records. So I think over long term, you still have that very positive picture to, to fall back on. Talk to me a little bit about the ETF story. We've spoken about this before. Uh, inflows are starting to taper down from those record setting days that we were talking about just a few days ago. Um, what, do you, what do you see when you look forward uh, as to the progression of ETFs? Yeah, so I think coming into the ETFs, you know, they launched in mid January. And so they're only about two months old. It's very fresh. And I think a lot of the expectations were to see around 5 billion or so of net inflows within a period of about a quarter. And what we've done so far has totally blown away the expectations. We had over 12 billion of total net inflows in the last two months. As a, an analogy that, that's helpful, I find uh, people look to the gold ETF, GLD. Uh, which actually accrued about 11 billion of net inflows over a three-year period. And so that was actually at the time the most successful commodity ETF that was launched. And so we actually see that Bitcoin is, again, outperforming all kinds of uh, expectations on this. And even at, call it 12 billion of net inflows, it's still a drop in the bucket when you think about all the demand and all the trapped, what I'll call trapped investment money or, or cash that's located in investment accounts, uh, for example, 401ks, or held in terms of uh, with registered investment advisors who cannot directly participate in spot Bitcoin markets. And so we still have a long way to go, in my opinion, but the product so far has been wildly successful. Let's talk about gold versus Bitcoin. Both hit all-time highs recently. Do you think if we look at the performance of the ETFs versus the performance of gold ETFs that Bitcoin could realistically replace gold as a global store of value? I mean, I certainly believe that. Uh, I think uh, Bitcoin has all the benefits that gold uh, proclaims to have. You know, for example, a, a sound money supply with a more predictable uh, expansion of, of supply in general. Uh, but it's really viewed as that kind of inflation hedge. And so when you think about the qualities that Bitcoin has, you have uh, global liquidity, the probably the highest value density. And what I mean by that is when I send uh, one Bitcoin or a thousand Bitcoins, it's not going to change the weight of the transfer or meaningfully change the size of the transaction. Uh, Bitcoin, of course, much more divisible. It's decentralized censorship resistant, 24-7, 365 markets. So these are qualities that gold just cannot replicate. And on top of that, Bitcoin has uh, what I would consider mathematically more sound or even more predictable and programmatic supply curve because it's built on mining and the halvings and whatnot. And so uh, I do think Bitcoin is a superior form of sound money than gold. Uh, right now, when we think about gold's performance, you have to keep in mind that this is a, a 10 plus trillion market capitalization asset in terms of what's above ground. Uh, with Bitcoin, it's still just hovering over 1 trillion. And so there's plenty of room for running if you believe that 
uh, Bitcoin ultimately replaces gold as far as a, a form of sound money. Now, we've been talking about Bitcoin, but the crypto market cap fell more than 8% in the last 24 hours. Uh, the Coindust 20 index down just over 10% the last time I checked. If we brought in the conversation now and look at assets other than Bitcoin, what do you think is going on there? Uh, in terms of like traditional assets or crypto? Uh, crypto assets. I think historically, when I look at prior cycles, there tends to be a lot of lead lag relationships. And so 2017, you had a run up in Bitcoin. You had the, the inception of the ICO and Ethereum taking off. And then that pushed Bitcoin even further. Uh, back in 2020, you had DeFi summer and that led the movement. And then Bitcoin, of course, took off after that. And so the... The order of events in terms of what is hot, what's not, and what's kind of pushing up sentiment in the market, it really did start with Bitcoin this time around. And so that was led, I think, a lot by the ETF discussion that happened in the second half of last year. And then, of course, seeing the event play out this year, um, in the beginning of this year. I think when people look forward to what the next trends are, in my opinion, the focus areas are going to be more near term, of course, the Ethereum ETF. I think... Uh, I would say the second half of this year, it's going to be a little bit more focused on global elections. This is a, a pretty choppy year geopolitically, not just the U.S. election, but I'm talking broader. There's a lot of elections happening this year, and it's, of course, a, an important year for that. And then beyond that, uh, I personally see a cyclical pattern when it comes to investments and maturity of applications and whatnot. And so when you think about the investments that were made in 2017 and 2018, they really started to mature in 2020 and 2021. We had record investments, tens of billions of dollars of venture money that went into projects back in 2021. And now we're hitting a three year mark. And that tends to be when you see a lot of these applications start to firm up, mature, find product market fit. And that's when you start to see sparks that you just don't expect. And so I'm, I'm kind of watching out for any inklings or, or interesting things that are happening uh, along those lines as well. Marcus Thielen, uh, who is head of 10X Research, joined our show yesterday, and he said that he doesn't think that an ETH ETF is going to be approved in May, like some other folks think, because of the lack of engagement from the SEC. It sounds like you think that an Ether ETF will be approved. So why do you think that's the case? Yeah, well, let me, let me re clarify this a bit. So for, when I think about the Ethereum ETF in the short run, it's really about uh, the speculation about it. So we're talking about price action and how things are going to move around. People are going to speculate on whether it's approved or not. I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I think it's a little bit too early. When I think about these event-driven catalysts, uh, particularly when it comes to ETFs, the most important thing to, to consider are the discussions that you're hearing about in reports. So if you start to see a lot of scoops, for example, uh, we saw it last uh, in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, BlackRock having discussions with SEC, for example, or a lot of issuers changing terms in their prospectus. If you see noise like that, that's indications that conversations are happening uh, leading up into the, the deadline. That to me is positive in general. If it's very quiet, uh, then I think that's going to be a little bit more negative signal. But it's a little bit too early, I think, to call one way or another whether the signals today are meaningfully uh, going to indicate whether we get an approval or not. Uh, Ethereum is a little bit more nuanced, particularly with the staking, but everything else is pretty much the same, frankly. You mentioned catalysts, and the next big catalyst everyone is looking forward to is the Bitcoin halving in April. Do you think that's priced in, or do you think we're going to see <laughs> uh, Bitcoin come out of this this little lull that we're in and possibly reach new all-time highs? Yeah, we always say it's priced. We always ask that question, whether it's priced in or not. Uh, I think historically, we've usually seen Bitcoin start to run up leading into the halving, and then we have about 12 to 18 months post having a, a positive performance overall. And this year, or this having rather, I think it's been a little bit more accelerated. So we've had more of a run up uh, leading into the having prior to it actually happening. But I do think that this having, in my opinion, is the most symbolic that Bitcoin will ever have. Uh, of course, the, the most powerful part about the having is the narrative that it builds. Everything about Bitcoin as sound money is derived from the fact that the having exists as a mechanism. And so when I think about 
uh, people who are coming into the space that are new, that part of the early majority in the adoption curve, or perhaps even institutions that are looking at Bitcoin as a potential store of value. And, and you're trying to describe it to them as a narrative uh, to be able to crisply tell them, hey, uh, by April of this year, 94% of all Bitcoins that will ever exist will have been created through the mining process. So there's only 6% left. And then on top of that, the annual supply growth of Bitcoin will fall to about 0.8%. And so uh, in, in combination with all the benefits that I highlighted earlier, like the global liquidity, market access 24-7, 365, value density, uh, you don't really have an asset that behaves like Bitcoin and has these qualities anywhere else in the world. And so when it comes to the having, for me, it's really about making that narrative as crisp as it gets. And in a moment when you have so much uncertainty around uh, central banking policy, around interest rates, for example, and the future of that, uh, interest payments as a percentage of of total uh, income or expenditures from the governments and whatnot. And so uh, I think that that messaging, because of this having in particular, is going to be super powerful. And I think it's going to speak well to the next stage of adoption. Thanks so much for joining the show this morning. Thank you. That was Head of Strategy at Kraken, Tomas Perfumo. That's it for Markets Daily.